War is hell. There's no doubt about it, and the atrocities committed throughout history are enough to turn your stomach. Today we are going to cover the lesser known events of cannibalism perpetrated by the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. The Chichijima incident is the most well known case of cannibalism as it involves former President George H.W. Bush. Chichijima is an island approximately 240 kilometers or 150 miles north of the infamous Iwo Jima. It was the primary location of long range Japanese radio stations during World War II and facilitated supplies and communication between Japan and the Bonin Islands. Due to its importance, the island was heavily fortified to protect it against frequent US air raids. This brings us to September 1944, when nine airmen, including a 20-year-old George H.W. Bush, were involved in an air raid with the objective to drop 400 to 500 pound bombs on a radio station in Chichijima. George Bush landed in the ocean near a life raft and inflated it. The ocean's tide was pulling him back toward the island and George had to paddle for four hours under the cover of American flyers. Eventually, he was rescued by the USS Finback, a submarine in the area. A video exists of George H.W. Bush recounting the crash in 2007, which I'll link in the description. Eight of George's comrades were captured by the Japanese. The airmen were beaten and tortured before they were beheaded on the orders of Lieutenant General Yoshi Tachibana. According to sources found in James Bradley's book, Flyboys, A Story of True Courage, four of the airmen executed, Marv Mershon, Floyd Hall, Jimmy Dye, and Warren Earl Vaughan, had their thighs and livers cut out by Dr. Taraki. Further testament to these claims is a statement made by a Japanese orderly who helped prepare the ingredients. Dr. Taraki cut open the chest and took out the liver. I removed a piece of flesh from the fly's thigh, weighing about 6 pounds and measuring 4 inches wide, about a foot long. Major Matoba had these parts prepared for a feast among officers during a party in his quarters. Captain Yoshi would also host a similar party of his own. It was believed the officers did this for alleged physical and spiritual benefits and as a way of revenge over their captives for the air raids. Lieutenant General Yoshio Tachibana, the Imperial Japanese Army, and 11 other Japanese military personnel were eventually tried for the beheadings of the two American airmen in August 1944 on Chichijima in the Bonin Islands. The US also tried Vice Admiral Mori and Major Matoba for murder and the deaths of the five US airmen in February 1945. During these trials, Major Matoba confessed to the cannibalism. The Chichijima incident was far from an isolated incident, and US POWs were not the only ones to face this fate. During World War II, Indian, Chinese and Malaysian POWs were shipped by the Japanese to New Guinea and neighboring islands. In the book, Hidden Horrors, Japanese War Crimes in World War II, the author, Yuki Tanaka, details the accounts of Japanese cannibalism in New Guinea. Hatham Ali, a Pakistani soldier who was forced into labor as part of approximately 1,000 prisoners, found himself in Manakwari in New Guinea under supervision of the S unit, and he had this to say about his captivity. I was included in this number, we were taken to a place about 300 miles away. We were employed for 12 hours daily on hard fatigues and we were given very little to eat. There was no medical treatment and all prisoners who fell ill were immediately killed by the Japanese. Later, due to allied attacks and the activity, the Japs also ran out of rations. We prisoners were made to eat grass and leaves, and due to starvation we even ate snakes, frogs, and other insects. At this stage, the Japanese started selecting prisoners, and every day, one prisoner was taken out and killed and eaten by the Japanese. I personally saw this happen, and about a hundred prisoners were eaten at this place by the Japanese. The remainder of us were taken to another spot about 50 miles away where 10 prisoners died of sickness. 
At this place, the Japanese again started selecting prisoners to eat. Those selected were taken to a hut where flesh was cut from the bodies while they were alive, and then they were thrown into a ditch alive, where they later died. When flesh was being cut from those selected, cries and shrieks came from them, and also from the ditch where they were later thrown. These cries used to gradually dim down when the unfortunate individuals were dying. We were not allowed to go near the ditch. No earth was thrown on the bodies and the smell was terrible. Ali would later be chosen, but ran away and was able to escape. After 15 days of wandering the jungle, he was rescued by Australian forces. By the time the camp that Ali had spent his time in was taken, the number of prisoners was reported to be less than 100, and investigators were unable to find any witnesses to corroborate his story. It is reported natives of New Guinea were also victims to alleged cannibalism, with testimonies made to Australian forces reporting ransacking and abduction of villages. Understanding the motives for each case of cannibalism is not always easy. Cannibalism was identified by Australian soldiers in 1943 during the early stages of the Kokoda campaign in New Guinea. It is reported in these areas where this behaviour had been identified, fallen Japanese troops still had dried fish and rice rations. This would allude to cannibalism in these cases not being performed out of starvation but rather for other motives. Those motives could have been hunger, spiritual or physical beliefs, or simply hatred and fear-mongering attempts. However, later in the Kokoda campaign, Japanese soldiers were found to be consuming their own, possibly in a form of group survival cannibalism, as food sources did start to dwindle and starvation set in. An affidavit from Felix Espinosa Jr. reads as the following. As a member of the patrol from Troop F, 8th Cavalry, under the leadership of Sergeant Alo, Our patrol was ordered by Captain Hickman to investigate a shot heard the previous night. Our patrol proceeded about 300 yards southeast of Bohu Ai on Manus Island. We crossed a small creek and entered a clearing in which we counted several lean-to and one shack. There was smoke rising from the Jap-occupied shack. We knew there were Japs in the shack from their voices. We observed a Jap walking from a brush pile just outside the shack. We shot him and three others inside the shack. The former had blood on his hands, which we found had come from a corpse lying under the brush pile. We lifted the brush and found a corpse of a Jap, and it was crudely butchered. The flesh was cut from the legs, from the knee to the hips. The calves of both legs were cut clear to the bone. The Jap had his hands tied and a rope around his waist. We checked the inside of the shack and found bloody mess gear and a bloody knife, the crude instrument used in butchering. We reported back to the camp. A small patrol was sent back under the control of Lieutenant Miller to investigate further. In December 1944, a captured Japanese soldier admitted under Australian interrogation that orders had been given stating eating the flesh of any Japanese soldier was punishable by death. However, the consumption of the enemy's flesh was permitted. These claims were further strengthened later that month, when Australian forces obtained a secret order issued by General Azo on November 18th, 1944. Stating Japanese soldiers caught consuming human flesh would be punished by execution, with the parentheses that the consumption of enemy flesh was exempt from punishment. In 1945, the Suzuki unit was deployed into the mountain jungles of the Bukinan region in the Philippines. Their goal was to combat native and American forces resisting Japanese occupation. After Japanese surrender, and during the trial of Dr. Hajime Noda, it was heard as time went on, Japanese forces ran low on food rations, and for a while were able to forage and steal food from nearby villages. Japanese soldiers started getting sick and dealing with diseases such as malaria and experiencing diarrhea. The doctor argued with the prosecutors during his trial that the only way to save his soldiers was to feed them meat saying, 
Whenever possible, we avoided killing by eating the bodies of people who died from illness or were killed in action or were executed for crimes. However, Rakimi Yamamoto, a soldier who had joined the Suzuki unit, testified, We frequently ate human meat as our dinner, boiled it with vegetables and ate it. The meat was brought into camps by patrols who had cut it up and dressed it. Sometimes the meat was dried and sun-cured. Since no other meat was available, we had to eat human flesh. For this reason, Filipinos were captured and butchered. I was so hungry I ate it, although I would have preferred pork. However, Lt. Alejandro Sala, the man who captured the unit, is quoted as saying, They were wild pigs and monkeys in the area, as well as edible plants. Prosecutors also described the lieutenant's accounts of the unit as followed. When the lieutenant captured the Suzuki unit, he found human bones and human flesh in the process of cooking, human skulls and fragments of the human body around the premises of the camp of the Suzuki unit, in and around the houses occupied by the members of the unit, and it can therefore be concluded that the killing of Filipinos and eating of their flesh were of common knowledge to all of the members of the unit who were encamped together in one place. A noter and nine of his men were sentenced to death for their crimes. It's hard to identify the motivations of cannibalistic behavior in the Japanese Imperial Army, and the situation is not black and white. Some of the evidence I found and used in this video were statements and witness accounts rather than tangible evidence. However, it is undeniable that these atrocities occurred, and while some may have done it for survival, there are many cases where using that as an excuse is questionable. I can't begin to fathom how terrifying some of these experiences would have been, especially considering the large number of those who were unable to share their story. Thanks for listening, and if I butchered any names, I'm sorry. Some of them are easier to find than others. Thank you.